it's been over in Red Hook, not down, kind of down and over. Okay, so in any case, I'm super excited to be here tonight, and I'm talking about one of the things that I'm really passionate about, and that's beads, beads kind of of all types. So, um, we'll just go ahead and do some thank yous right away. Um, this is mainly based on my doctoral dissertation work. Um, so, I have to thank a lot of folks. Some of this was funded by uh, a National Science Foundation grant, as well as funding from the Wisconsin Archaeological Society, and um, I have staff at the Chicago Field Museum, as well as my doctoral advisor to thank. And I worked with more than 30 different museums and universities and other kinds of curating institutions all over the Midwest, so big thanks to them. And then, of course, to um, Arnie and this organization for inviting me, and all of you for coming out on a, a Thursday night to, to hear this, so thank you. Um, so a little bit more about me, who's this person that you're going to hear from for the next hour or so. Um, I completed my PhD in Madison in 2015, and I'm really interested in the 17th and 18th century, kind of the time that glass trade beads and copper kettles and other kinds of European-made objects started arriving in this part of the world and getting reinterpreted and remade and used for a lot of different things. Um, so I am also a material scientist. So basically what that means is that I take a look at the chemical and physical properties of artifacts and use that to learn what they're made out of and maybe how they were traded. Um, and then a project that I'm super excited about is um, a project working with Margaret Defoe and the Redcliffe Band of Lake Superior Chippewa over in Redcliffe, Wisconsin. And we have been excavating a site uh, in Frog Bay Tribal National Park, and that's me this summer working on one of our units. Um, and that's not a, um, it's not a 17th century site. We think it's probably an archaic site, so dating back three or four thousand years at least. And we haven't found any beads there yet, but we've only dug a very small part of it, so maybe more to come. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, so I, I was taking a look at the list. How many, um, how many people have done archaeology in some form? Whether you've helped out on a dig or you have some training in it. Yeah, Jules got her hand up. Yes. Okay. So about half of us here have at least some training in archaeology. So I'm going to try and kind of split the difference between like a very general talk, and I also have some scatter plots and numbers in here, but I'll try and go through those in a way that kind of makes sense to everyone. I hope. So I was told I have two hours, but I'm not going to talk at you for two hours. I teach undergraduates. I know that doesn't fly. So I'll give you a little bit of a lecture in terms of giving some history on beads and adornments in the Upper Great Lakes and talk about some of the methods that we as archaeologists have to study these things. And I'll illustrate that with a couple of um, pretty neat case studies that I did as part of my dissertation. So we're reworking kettle scraps and then taking a look at glass trade beads. Um, and then the final thing is that I did bring some glass beads and I brought a microscope and I thought we could just kind of do a little mini workshop on uh, how some of the ways that archaeologists um, have to study these things. So um, there will be kind of an interactive portion of tonight. So that's my plan. Sound good? Cool. Okay. Gosh, you guys are more talkative than my, my undergrads. <laughs> it's great. I love it. All right, so let's start at the beginning. Like, everyone knows that playing in the dirt can be an awful lot of fun. Uh, it's certainly the thing that hooked me in as an archaeologist. I love being outside. I love digging in the dirt. Um, so here are some images from some digs I've done over the last several years. This one's over in Oshkosh, and this one was in Fort McCoy, Wisconsin. Um, and you can see that I've just found this arrowhead, and I'm pretty excited about it. And we all enjoy this part of archaeology. It's the discovery. It's the finding things. But that's just the beginning of what we can do to learn about these materials. So we don't want our stuff to get boxed and put away and then never looked at again, right? Nobody wants this. That's great, but imagine what's in all those boxes. This is how museums feel, right? This is how sometimes you go into a storeroom and there's all this stuff. We want to actually learn from it. So what I've actually been specializing in is called collections-based research. That's going to museums and other institutions and places where you might find these artifacts being stored. So these are some images from the Madeline Island Museum. And you can see that this is a 1970s era photograph of a salvage excavation that took place. And they have their slides and their binders and all these paper records. That's all archaeology too. 
So some of what, what I've been doing is going back and, and digging through these old collections and learning about them. There are old collections from, um, from Redcliffe where we've been looking at what archaeologists in the 1970s actually dug up but never really learned anything from. So a lot of my work involves kind of digging through what previous archaeologists did. And that's why we keep all this stuff. Like, you might think that the best part of archaeology is doing the dig. But it's so important that we collect these things and then make sure that they get preserved properly. So putting them in the right kind of boxes or bags, making sure that any organic material doesn't decompose. Um, we keep it because there's always something more to learn. So some of what I'm going to talk about um, are techniques that we didn't even have in the 1970s or 60s when these artifacts were uncovered. Um, things like laser ablation mass spectrometry was not invented when many of the artifacts I've looked at were dug up. So we curate or we keep archaeological collections because we never know what we're going to invent. Think how quickly like DNA studies have moved in the last 10 to 20 years. So I'm pretty excited to talk about some of those. So let's take a quick look at a map. Um, Good, we're, we're on the map here, but just barely. So these are all of the archaeological sites that I looked at um, as part of my doctoral research. I've been expanding eastward a little bit into Ontario, Canada, and I'll, I'll talk about that later. But this is the sample of 38 archaeological sites that had either glass trade beads or um, artifacts made from copper or brass trade kettles like the one you see here. So these are sites that date from around 1630 to about 1730 AD, plus or minus. And all of these were sites that were previously excavated. So I went to their collections and I took a look at what had been, uh, what had been identified already. Um, so, beads. I wanted to go back a little bit further in time. As I mentioned, I'm really interested in the 17th and the, the 18th century when we have glass trade beads, when we have um, some of these materials that are coming in and that allow for like the intricate beadwork that might be done on clothing or um, other kind of textiles. But bead making is not something that showed up uh, in the 17th century. This is something that people have been doing for thousands of years. So for example, these are river shell beads um, from the site of Astolin, which is near Madison, Wisconsin. It's a Mississippian mound site. It's about a thousand years old. Um, these are, this is actually a replica, these are wampum shell beads made from marine shell um, that would have been potentially traded, and sometimes beads like this have turned up in uh, mound sites in Michigan and Wisconsin, um, dating to the Hopewell period and later. Um, we have copper beads. Copper bead making does date back thousands of years, um, especially with all of the access to Lake Superior copper that we have here. In Minnesota, we also have catmonite or pipestone, which is a soft red stone that you can grind into different shapes. And even animal bone was used for making beads. So when we think about um, kind of what happens in the 17th and 18th century, why do we get all these beads? Well, it's because people were interested in this material, that people could appreciate beads as something that could be useful. So um, I'm, not a, I'm not a specialist in pre-European sites that have a lot of beads on them. Um, but I wanted to point out that this is something that goes back a very long time. Uh, and that is, for one reason, because of all of the native copper in the area. So has anyone been out to Isle Royale? Yeah? Okay, cool. So did you get to see the big mining pits? Yes. They're amazing. When you think about the scale of industry that uh, people were doing to get at the copper sources, digging down um, very deep in the ground and, and um, accessing and kind of following these veins of copper. Um, and these deposits are actually all along the kind of the south shore of the lake. And people would turn these pieces of copper <coughs> into either beads or tinkling cones or spear points, many different kinds of material culture. But um, the thing that I'm most interested in is the personal adornments. Personal adornments are actually not the first thing that people start making out of copper. The first thing that people start doing is making spear points, so projectile points, things for fishing, um, things for hunting, um, and those are, those are fairly large. Archaeologists have argued that potentially it got less accessible to get at the copper, so people started making smaller things, um, like these little tiny rolled beads. Um, these are only a couple of centimeters long at the most. Um, there are other po possible explanations. Maybe the meaning of copper changed over time. 
Um, maybe people just got more interested in having copper beads than they, than they were in copper spear points. But in any case, um, we know that copper use has been a really important uh, beading and adornment technology in the Western Great Lakes for at least the last 6,000 years. So there's a really long tradition of using beads in this way and making bracelets and um, making necklaces or using them as hair tubes, hair decorations, lots of different ways you could use these beads. So um, when the French explorers, traders, and missionaries showed up with copper and brass kettles in the 17th century, these were perceived as another source of copper, and it meant that perhaps you didn't have to go out to Isle Royale and mine it. Um, the Jesuits record getting kind of frustrated with um, how people were using these. So they would trade a, a kettle with the local Anishinaabe people that they would run into, and it was considered to be really important, a really precious kind of thing that they could get. Um, and that's interesting because the kettles weren't being used as cooking vessels. Um, people knew how to cook food. You didn't have, have to make a, have to buy a copper kettle. You could cook in a birch bark container. You could cook in a ceramic container. But rather, and this was like much to the Jesuits' chagrin, they were um, taking these kettles and cutting them up, turning them into beads or I'm going ahead. Yeah, there we go. Turning them into beads, turning them into tinkling cones, pendants, uh, tubes, making knives out of them, making awls out of them, everything but cooking out of these kettles. Because, I mean, it doesn't make sense. I, I know what I do with copper. I'm going to make exactly what I've always made out of copper, right? Beads. You're going to make something that's useful to you. You don't need a kettle. So archaeologists, when we talk about this kind of thing, we talk about this as hybrid material culture. So we've argued that these beads represent kind of a blending of people's ideas, like what do I do with this copper and what do I need to make out of it? So what's important to me as someone faced with a big kettle? Well, it's a big kind of flat piece of copper that could easily be cut up and turned into all of the things here. So that's what I mean when I say it kind of blends existing stylistic or technological traditions. Right? People are taking unfamiliar materials and recycling them in interesting ways. You could kind of think about it like those, um, those park benches or shoes or things that you see now made out of like old soda bottles, right? We're taking something familiar and turning it into something that's more useful to us. It's kind of the same idea. It's, it's just a, a way of making something useful that's not useful to you in its current form. So. Here is some of what happened. Um, this is from a site near Lake Winnebago called the Doty Island site. And there are just tons and tons and tons of uh, tinkling cones or jingle cones. Um, this is actually a private collector, so they're all kind of on these weird little wires. Um, but they, they came from an archaeological context. This is a flattened um, bell. And then there's other various beads and spirals here as well. But these are all cut from trade kettles. So people were recognizing that the, the copper was much more valuable, much more useful for something that you already knew how to make, like that archaic period tinkling cone I showed you a few slides back. Um, here's another really cool thing that people did with them. They started making these really tiny beads. Uh, these are less than a millimeter in diameter most of the time. So up at the top, here's one millimeter. So these are like two millimeters wide. These are maybe one millimeter wide. They're very small, and they would have made, um, we don't get the, them intact. Often we're just going to find like one little lost loose bead like this. But occasionally we'll find them strung, so it seems like people were decorating um, a, like a necklace or belts or um, garters maybe with all of these little tiny rolled metal beads. And what's cool about the trade petals is that they came in different colors, right? Red, copper, yellow, brass. So we think it's possible that people might have even used different colors of metal to make different patterns. Um, but because it's all kind of corroded this lovely green, that's kind of a hard thing to test. It's something we could test um, using some of the equipment at the Field Museum, but I haven't quite got there yet. But in any case, it's just another way of using even the smallest little scrap of a kettle. Um, so at this point, I want to kind of start bringing this together. I've given you some of the examples of, of the different kinds of beads and adornment. Um, but I want to also connect this to today, right? As an archaeologist, I'm constantly trying to make sure that what I do is relevant. So I've got a quote from a Meskwaki scholar, Brenda Papaki Ackerman, um, who's been studying ribbon work 
um, in, in her nation's tradition. So here's what she has to say. Um, she says that since the beginning, the Squawky people made their garments by adapting to their surrounding environment, right? Whether use of porcupine quills, trade ribbon, polyester, satin, or sewing machines, the Meskwaki continued to creatively adapt to changes under their own terms and, the most, and meet their cultural needs through the invention of important traditions and the embellishment and construction of dress. So there's a lot to unpack here, but I think what she's trying to argue is that the same kinds of patterns and the same ideas and meanings that might be found on a Meskwaki garment today might be reflected in ribbon work and bead work from the 1800s and that those designs in turn reflect back how people would have adorned clothes dating all the way back to before European materials became available. So using quill work, using paint. Um, and all of those technologies kind of are just being used to encourage the same idea of Meskwaki identity. So that's a really kind of interesting thing for me to think about. Um, right, as a Euro-American settler scholar, I have to think about what would it have been like um, to try and continue your identity in the face of a lot of change. And so um, I think she's really onto something in that it doesn't really matter what the material type it is, ribbon or quills or satin or sewing machines, the ideas behind some of these designs remain the same, kind of like what Marnie was saying about the, the different plants. So, um, I kind of take this as we go back into the archaeological record. Um, in the 17th century, we're looking at a period of really dynamic change. A lot of these things moving ahead of Europeans themselves. So Europeans aren't making their way into the Western Great Lakes until the 1630s, 1640s, and we don't really have a sustained European presence until like 1670, 80, 90, really 1700. Um, so a lot of this stuff is moving down the line along waterways and existing trade networks. And we really just have these very early initial encounters that were often related to trade. Um, so in eastern Wisconsin, we're talking about uh, Ho-Chunk people, Menominee people, in northern Wisconsin, Ojibwe, Odawa, Anishinaabe peoples, um, as well as newcomers. Some of my new work deals with Huron-Wendat or Wyandot communities and how they moved also into the Great Lakes. Potawatomi people moving um, westward from Michigan. So everyone's bringing with them beads and tinkling cones and pottery. And we're trying to understand how do these things reflect different groups of people. Archaeologists want to know who, who was here, what kind of archaeological site are we looking at. And can we use these things that people use to represent themselves as a way to trace these people moving around the landscape? How can we trace communities? So this is a map that kind of tries to kind of map that out. So again, different groups in eastern Wisconsin. Um, in the north, again, there's a lot of movement of people. The, the map just says Ojibwe, but we know that this is not, that's a pretty big term. That there's many different smaller communities within this. Um, the same is true for Algonquin groups and Iroquois groups. Um, by 1670, when this map is tried to reflect, the Huron Wyandot are actually moved southward, um, even though their original territory is here in Ontario. Potawatomi people are moving into Wisconsin by this time. The Meskwaki have moved westward, even though at 1700 they were closer to Lake Winnebago. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is that maps only can represent a snapshot. It's like one point in time, but people move around. Nobody stays in one place long enough to be on a map um, for very long. And so the French were really faced with this. We have maps, like this is a map from 1718. And what the French are trying to do is place different groups of indigenous people on the map so that they would know who they're trying to trade with or perhaps who they should avoid. Um, for example, the Foxes and the French did not get along very well. Um, and so they were kind of recording that this area, the River of the Fox, was over here and maybe you didn't want to go there. Um, you can see here's Sault Ste. Marie, Michel Mackinac, <coughs> Ottawa Village, um, St. Michel, um, that's kind of near modern day Ashland. Uh, what else? Chicago. So it's a fairly familiar map. But again, this is just one little snapshot in time. And so these mapped social groups, they correspond with archaeological sites. This is pretty neat. This is one of the best ways that archaeologists have of trying to figure out 
who relates to an archaeological site, um, along with oral traditions, which are really helpful too, because people will talk about uh, how long it took to get from here to there. Um, and some of the French records as well. So we've got like the River of the Fox, the Isle of the Potawatomi. There are archaeological sites that correspond to these places that have the same kind of material culture that you would expect to find for those different groups. Um, so at many of these sites, we find objects of personal adornment. So one of my big questions is, how do we use these beads to connect to the people at these sites and trace them as they move around these dynamic landscapes? So this is an artifact that I like to show an awful lot. It's kind of a mystery artifact. So it's a jingling cone, it's a tinkling cone, but it has two beads, a black one and a white one, kind of crimped inside of it. It looks intentional, like it's kind of closed up in such a way that those beads aren't going to slip in there accidentally when it's sitting in the ground. And it's something that I really, I don't know what it means. I, I'm an archaeologist, I found it in a collection, I said, wow, that's really interesting, but I don't know what it means. Um, we know that this cone is copper, so it would have been reddish when it um, was in use, probably. Um, and it has a black and a white bead in it. And does that mean anything? I'm, I'm not sure. But we know that someone used this. Um, it's, a, it's a representation of, of something. Um, and as an archaeologist, I'm curious about, well, can we learn anything about what that meant to someone? Um, so let me know if you have thoughts on that. Okay. So... Um, that kind of is the introductory part of the talk. Um, do you have questions now, I guess, or thoughts on this bead or collection of beads before I go on? Was there just one of those beads? Yeah, there's just one. I, I went through every single little <coughs> tinkling cone in that collection and there were like, I think, several hundred of them. This was the only one that, that had this kind of intentional crimping of beads inside. It doesn't rattle. That's a question I get asked. Like, people ask me, like, it sounds different, but it doesn't. They don't move around, they're like wedged in there. It could have just deadened the jingle, so it jingled differently than other cones. Yeah, I, yeah. Well, was this during a uh, time when there were uh, religious people coming into the area and visiting with native people? Yeah, um, so the Marquette Mission site, as you might, as you might yeah. guess, so Father Marquette set up a mission uh, at St. Ignace, uh, supposedly 1670 to 1700. Um, yeah. So, from what I understand a little bit, I forgive me, this is no, a little good. bit out of my area of expertise, but uh, uh, from a little bit I know about Father Marquette, the way he liked to explain uh, the Holy Trinity was you had the Father and the Son, and they were encompassed by the Holy Spirit. So he yeah. might have had uh, two separate things and then incorporated them into the bead as an overarching thing. Uh, the same group of people did traditionally, like in the past, the same thing with the Irish, but that was a long, long time ago, using stuff in the local area to incorporate uh, and to relate to the people with their religion. So I, maybe cool. that could be a thought. I, don't that, know. I have not heard that one, but that one makes a lot of sense. This is the beauty of archaeology. We have absolutely no way of knowing. Like, there is no way to test any of this, so, like whether it sounded different or whether it was a teaching tool for catechism or whether it means something that's totally now unknown to us. Um, but I think it's really interesting to think about when we find a unique artifact like this. Um, yeah, cool. Did you ask the community that it came from? Yeah, so this would have been a Huron-Wendat community. Um, so they spent a lot of time in Ontario and then they, some of them went south like to the Finger Lakes region of New York and then some kind of traveled through Wisconsin and Michigan, supposedly stopped in Ashland and then made their way back to this spot. Um, and right now, there are no Huron-Wendat communities in Michigan, which is kind of problematic. Everyone ended up in um, Kansas and Oklahoma. So I haven't had a chance to ask anyone from that community. Um, but I would be interested in hearing any ideas anyone has on this. Yeah. Okay, so it's an interesting artifact. Let's, let's go deeper into these metal artifacts that we have um, that represent um, again, the 17th and 18th century, how people were taking trade items and turning them into other things. Um, so this is an article that I recently put together that deals with more than 3,000 pieces of cut up trade kettles and other objects uh, that were, were used at all the sites that I showed you on that earlier map. 
So it wasn't just beads that were um, being fashioned out of kettles. We have a lot of things that would have been used as projectile points. Uh, this is maybe on its way to becoming a tinkling cone or becoming a pendant if you put a hole in it. And then there's a lot of just other general scrap that doesn't look like it was necessarily on its way to being anything or maybe it was waiting to be used. Um, and so what we found was that among all of these different sites, there was a ton of different variation. So we want to think about why that is, like what could cause people to make beads in different ways. And truth be told, there's a lot of different reasons, right? Um, the first one is like what materials are available. If you aren't getting any kettles, then you're not going to make tinkling cones. That's fairly straightforward. You'll continue making um, things that jingle out of um, animal bone or native copper. Um, so this is a dress from the 19th century, and it's pretty cool because it has some coins um, used as adornments. It has some shell beads on it, but it also has porcupine quill work um, here. And then if we zoom in, which I will in a second, it has some other materials. So when trade goods became accessible, um, when that timing occurred, then you might start to see embellishments coming in in different ways. So in this case, these are um, tin, they're tin tinkling cones, which is hard to say, and they have, um, I think this is moose hair. It's online at a museum exhibit about dressing globally, and so they did talk to um, actual jingle dress dancers who talked about what the sounds meant, and they talk a little bit about making the cones out of um, tobacco tin tops, and how this dress actually just represents a step in a continuity of, of this, this way of dressing. And so it's a really cool online exhibit. Whoa, sorry, pointing. It's a really cool uh -huh. online exhibit um, at the Peabody Museum. So um, there's a lot of different things that all of these different kinds of beads and adornments can can represent. Yeah. Did you say what that is? Uh, I have to click my link. Do I have the internet? I, I don't. don't. This one they don't know. It's from it's from like um. Yeah. Do you want Wi-Fi real quick? Oh, uh, can I have the internet real quick? Yeah. Awesome. All right, we're gonna zoom out. You might get to see my desktop. Yikes. Um. So I'm not sure they know. So the problem with a lot of these collections from the 19th century is that um, the collectors would just pick it up and they would just say Indian dress. Well, yeah. yeah. But, and, um, so a lot of these museum collections, we don't have any more information about it. All right, what am I looking for? Um, there we go. 1854? Nope. Do I need a key? Uh, oh, yeah. I got it. That was made in 1854? No, I'm, I'm connecting to the right website, hopefully. <laughs> it could have been. Actually, that's not a bad guess. <laughs> All right, I want to show you the exhibit real quick. Thanks for, for humoring me. <laughs> I'm signing on. Yes. OK, here we go. Um, and I do like the idea that, I do like the idea that I have the internet. Am I going to, no? definitely find that link to share with you at some point. Um, it's a cool exhibit. I looked at it like last month, so it's here. The link may have just changed. So, I did close out. Okay. I just wanted to know what drive Yeah, I, I do too. I would love to know. Who would you start it? No, I... This is a real problem with the museum collections, right? Like, people would just collect well, I these picture things. to the right that tells me Chinabe or Chippewa or Jimabe after they originated kind of in the area here. I'm yeah. just curious as to the, yeah. what tribe or what, maybe what location. And that's the question, like, had. does that dress give the right person enough information to know who would have worn it? 
it doesn't it doesn't give me that information, but maybe it gives someone in the audience that information. And that's the thing that archaeologists really struggle with is like when we find just one bead or one artifact, how do we how do we figure out what that meant to somebody, right? Um, yeah. So it's an interesting question. Um, I'll show you what kind of brute force method we as archaeologists have been throwing at artifacts like this. Um, so because we find things kind of disjointed in the archaeological record, we'll find like a piece of kettle scrap or this triangular um, blank that people have interpreted as an arrow point or a spear point. Um, we kind of use every piece of information available to us from these things. Um, so doing things like measuring how long and how wide it is, how thick is the metal, how many holes does it have in it. Um, and so what I was doing with looking at these like 3,000 different pieces of kettle scrap was measuring how they were folded or rolled or scored. That means like cut across but not completely cut, up, cut in half. Uh, how they were bent, how they were clipped or perforated or even riveted. So the question is, can we find a larger pattern from looking at a bunch of different scraps from all of these different archaeological sites to see if we can say, like, okay, so Potawatomi people are doing this one way and Ojibwe people are doing this another way. Is there, is there any information we can get on that? Um, so I recorded all of those things as well as the different kinds of things that were present at each one of those sites, um, from how many um, jingle cones there were to um, pendants, bracelets, there's little tiny rolled beads, all of that. I recorded all of these things at every site with the idea that maybe there is a bigger pattern here. So, um, there's also things like patches. So the idea being that maybe sometimes you would use a kettle, like a kettle, and when it got a hole in it, you would put a patch on it. And then perhaps kettles would wear out, and then you would turn them into something. So this is a tinkling cone that actually has rivets on it, as if it was made from a patch like this. So like a third stage of recycling things. So recording all of this information about thousands of little pieces of metal from all of these different sites. Most of them were not that cool. Most of them were not the finished stuff. They were things like partially worked scraps, the little bits of rectangular things that could have been a bead, um, or partially worked things that were like on their way to being something before they got put aside or just really bent up pieces that were just scraps, as far as I can tell. Um, just started after some amount of reworking. So, what did I find? After all of this time spent in dark rooms looking at little scraps of metal, this was my doctoral dissertation, they really put us through the ringer. Um, we did find patterns in how people at these different sites made and produced different kinds of artifacts, as well as how many of those they were producing, and the different ways of producing them within styles. So like, there are many different ways to make a metal projectile point out of a kettle. So here's the data friendly part of my talk. So if you like bar charts and scatter plots, <laughs> if you don't hang in there, I'm going to try and get through this in a way that makes sense. Um, so let's talk about just the very biggest um, differences here. Were there finished artifacts, like things recognizable as a bead, or unfinished things, like things that seem to be scrap? So finished is the dark bars, unfinished, and then I did a third category for patches and kettle parts. Things that like seemed like they were part of a handle, or a rivet, or another kind of a, a kettle piece. Um, so you'll notice that the bell site has the most patches of any of the sites, and I'll get back to that later. And that's the place where we found that tinkling cone made out of a patch that would have once gone on a kettle. Um, the sites are put in order here from earliest sites around 1630, 1640. These are down in Illinois, all the way up to Fort Mitchell, Mackinac, Fort St. Joseph that go well into the 18th century. Um, you'll notice that the Illinois sites have almost no patching. Um, they're really just not into patching their kettles. It's possible they weren't even getting whole kettles. Some archaeologists have argued that most of the metal coming down to Illinois was coming in already cut up. It's so far west that in these early sites, there weren't whole kettles being traded, but rather it was kind of moving down the line even ahead of the Europeans. Um, there's a couple sites that have more finished items than unfinished ones. Um, so those are kind of outliers, but for the most part, every other site has more scrap than finished material. 
Now it's possible that these are like places where people are getting finished material already made, kind of coming in, or at least that more of it was coming in. I'm not really sure. Um, GrowCap is a um, it's another uh, Huron site in northern <coughs> Michigan, and Doty Island uh, has a couple different occupations, but it is uh, near Lake Winnebago. Uh, the Mailer component is the Meskwaki component. So different ethnicities, different cultural groups. And then what's really interesting is that the two French colonial fortification sites had way more scrap than finished material. Um, lots more. Like the proportion of how much uh, unfinished, like just kind of partially worked stuff, um, is greatly different than any of the, the Native American sites. So I think that's probably a result of like the French just like bringing in boatloads of, of scraps or of kettles and those being cut up but not necessarily a need to, um, to, to recycle in the way that other people were doing. Um, so it's a really interesting pattern. It wasn't something that I was really expecting. But it does show the difference in how different groups of people would have been working with stuff. Um, so here's when we start really kind of breaking it down. The Bell site, it's a Meskwaki site, way more patching, um, way more than any of the other archaeological sites. So maybe it's a, it's a cultural thing. Maybe it's an idea that you're, we're going to use these kettles and then they're going to get holes in them and we're going to patch them, whereas other people might use them for a different purpose. Um, here again, I'm highlighting the scrap at the two French colonial fortifications. Uh, Fort Michel and Mackinac actually has much more as part of its assemblage um, than Fort St. Joseph. Michel and Mackinac is closer again to the French fur trade routes Fort St. Joseph is kind of down in this corner of southwest Michigan. It's a little bit more inaccessible. So maybe the patterning here does actually make sense in terms of proportions. Um, again, here's that high proportion of tinkling cones at the grow cap site. Maybe a different reason for using them. And then finally, the, um, the site in Illinois, the Zimmerman site. Way more clips and beads and far fewer tinkling cones. Um, so I've argued that um, the Illinois groups, the Illini communities at this time, were just expressing identity differently, clips and beads instead of um, tinklers. And that's just an interesting difference. Um, here's a final kind of interesting stylistic difference that I wanted to point out with these. Um, it's a bit hard to see, but everywhere you see an arrow, uh, there's a horizontal line on the jingle cone. So... Um, it seems decorative. I, I can't think that there'd be any kind of functional like sound difference. But there's only four of these, and I looked at more than 500 different tinkling cones, and I mean I weighed and measured and counted and all that stuff. And there's four of them from three different archaeological sites across the Great Lakes. So that's really cool. So the sites are over here, uh, Market Mission, Rock Island, and Peshtigo Point. So you can almost imagine somebody sitting on Rock Island in the middle of winter making these things and they... Oh, what? Oh, yeah, pardon What? On uh, what side did you see the most bones? Oh, that's a numbers question. Um, <laughs> Rock Island had a pile of them. Rock yeah. Island had several, I think like 200. So it's a bigger sample, right? So that's actually a bigger sample size and might mean you have more variety. And one of them does come from Rock Island. But Peshtigo Point, there are only like six. So what's this one doing down there? Well, I see, notice that there was two periods that hit Rock Island. There, yeah. The previous one, there's... Three and four. Yeah. yeah. And you know, looking at the, the previous two previous sites, that has the Potawatomi and the, the... What's the OG? Oh. If you, go, the, if you go back to one more side. Yeah, the Odawa, right? Yeah. What, yeah, okay, I've never heard. Um, so the French would call them Ottawa. It's just okay. another. It's just an, another Anishinaabe group. Yep. Um, so Rock Island's a really interesting site because we have different layers of occupation, and the archaeologists have said like this is the Huron layer, and then on top of it is the Potawatomi layer, and then on top of that is an Odawa layer, and they're basing that on the Jesuit documents, the historical documents. Um, so some people disagree with those interpretations. So I was trying to see, like, is there a difference in the tinkling cones between the Potawatomi layer and the Odawa layer? And yeah, there is, actually. So maybe that's kind of leading us to think about ethnicity. So 
So I know there's not a lot of soil on that island. No, it's all sand. But yeah, you can see there's more unfinished stuff in the period tree Potawatomi uh, layer. Yeah. So. So, in any case, we're trying to figure out um, something about identity, something about trade, something about why people would make beads or, or adornments like this, um, and why in this whole big sample are there only like four that have this different pattern. So it's another case of like, I found this interesting bit of information. What does it mean? I'm still working on those interpretations. So are you saying that was in about 1670? Yeah, plus or minus, 1670, Peshigo Point could be a little earlier. This particular cone from Rock Island, I think, came from the Potawatomi period three, so 1670 to 1730. So what's your, how, how, how do you put a date on it? Those are all interpreted based on the historical records at this time. So like the Jesuits are coming in and they're talking about going to the island of the Potawatomis, right? Remember I showed you the map with that? So we know the map is dated to whatever date. So we're trying to understand, like, who did the French actually run into? And did they know where they were? And if so, did they write down the right group of people? Or just, like, what they were told, um, which could have been wrong entirely? And does that actually correlate with anything in the archaeological record? Yeah, it's not easy, right? Yeah. What are the dates on the dips? Um, like when were the sites excavated? Yeah, you know, Rock Island was excavated in the 1960s, Marquette Mission in the 1980s, and Peshtigo Point is kind of a weird site because it's kind of partially underwater, so people just walk the shoreline. It's near, um, well, Peshtigo, Wisconsin. Yeah. So um, there have been collectors who've been working there, um, Cubby Quibblon and Ron Strodney, if you know them, but for years. So. Uh, Dr. Dave Overstreet, who works with the College of the Menominee Nation, has been doing a lot to document Peshtigo Point. So, yeah, it's not like some crazy archaeologist was sitting there scoring up these things. Like, this is definitely something that we're finding um, as is. Yeah. I've argued it's an individual style. Someone just got an idea, and maybe they got traded up and down. But, I don't know. Okay. A little bit more on the... Um, the projectile points, which I think is pretty cool, too. There were less of these, so hundreds of, of tinkling cones. Only about a dozen projectile points. They come in a bunch of different flavors, so to speak. These would all go on either uh, spears or arrow points or various pointy things. This looks massive and wicked. It's only about this big. It's a, it's a little tiny serrated metal thing. Um, over here, uh, at Gro go Blech, Grove Path and Marquette Mission, again, um, a Huron Wendat site. They're only making the triangular ones. Nothing else. Nothing else in the archaeology. You find the triangular ones on Rock Island as well. You find stemmed ones up on Madeline Island. Um, different kinds, some with the little base notches, some with the different long stems. This is exactly like stone points look from these sites as well. I have to say, like, there are points that look like this made out of stone going back thousands of years. Um, so there's a few like that. There's one from the Lake Winnebago region with a stem on it. So sample size of one, I can't say too much about it. But we do have a stem point from Rock Island. The serrated ones only show up there. And it's interesting that at the Meskwaki sites, there are zero metal projectile points. No one is interested in making that. Tinkling cones, yes. Beads, sure. Not projectile <coughs> points. Um, so on Madeline Island, people are doing it. Over at Marquette Mission, people are interested in these, but not at the Meskwaki sites near Lake uh, Winnebago. And not at the Illinois sites. They're more interested in, again, those clips and those little rolled beads. And finally, not at the French colonial sites, Fort Michilimackinac uh, or Fort St. Joseph. So it's interesting. Rock Island is a meeting place. It's a place that many different groups of people went to, like I was just saying, right, over lots of time. So we've got lots of different styles of projectile points. Over here at the Straits, uh, at the Straits by St. Ignace, there's only one kind, only stemmed kinds on Madeline Island. So what I think this might represent is different communities and how they might have utilized these different kettles in different ways. Um, there's certainly other interpretations. Maybe it has something to do with the kinds of material available. 
but I think the best explanation is that it has to do with people's um, identity. So here's another awesome, this is a, a, a news article from Indian Country Today. And I just wanted to illustrate, like, this is a, a tradition that continues, right? And that, as you were saying, like, you can tell something about how the different dresses and the different um, cones and the different styles are made. That's what we're trying to find, but looking at it one tiny piece at a time in the archaeological record. So we found patterns of variation. I think these patterns relate to a lot of different things, like when did trade kettles become available to start making these things? Um, how available were those, and were they coming in whole or maybe partially processed? Um, how were the sites being used, right? Is, a, is it a habitation site? Is it a French colonial trade site? And finally, who was there? Um, so who's interested in making beads? Who's interested in making tinkling combs? So that's kind of the, the metal summary. Um, so do you have any more questions on metals? I don't know, or the metal beads, or the tinkling cones, or the, yeah. Uh, you know, what's on that dress, that big one from Michigan. The, the pink dress, or the, the little yeah. one? Yeah, there's a store over there called Knock Me Trading Store. Oh, the, the internet <laughs> one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You can get them pre-rolled now, right? Yeah. yeah, so you don't have to sit there and cut your fingers up on the shears. <laughs> I've tried making these things, and it's a it's a huge pain. I got some copper sheeting, and I'm sitting there, and I'm trying to roll it, and I'm cutting up my knuckles, and I'm like, heck with this. So if you can buy them on the internet. Oh, the copper? You got to make out of copper? Yeah. Yeah, I got like a like a two mil sheet. Um, it was it did not go well. No. No, I should stick to digging things up. Um, or, or stick to using like tobacco tip tops, right? Because that's going to be a little more bendy. I don't know. All right, next yeah. summer. <laughs> it's on. <laughs> Collective tin tops. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what I think. I'm trying to trace people as they move around. But I've only got the little bits of, you know, the little bits of stuff they left behind. The single cone that fell off, fell, fell off somebody's dress and ended up in the archaeological record for someone to dig up 300 years later. And maybe it was lucky enough to have those little stripes on it. And can we use that to trace people moving around? I don't know. Okay, well, you were promised glass trade beads. You ready for some more? Yeah, okay, cool. I have glass trade beads up here, so um, we'll, we'll get into the interactive portion in just a bit. But some of this you've already heard. I've already talked about beads kind of at length. So you know glass beads are important. Um, when colonial artists started coming in, they started recording all the different ways that people would utilize beads. So I really like George Catlin's paintings because he actually would write down the real names of people, not just like Indian woman or Mandan girl, um, but sometimes we have real names of people. Um, and it says what she's wearing. So in this case we've got shell, we've got blue glass beads, and vermilion, like a red pigment. It also looks like there's um, animal fur, maybe feathers. So they're really detailed, realistic paintings that can tell us something about for example, what plains people were doing with beads. Um, and beads are useful because, again, they help us tell time. Like, when did these things start showing up? How did people use them? How did they use them to represent their identity? Where were they getting them? How are they moving down the line from one place to another? Um, so here are some of the different kinds of beads that you might find on a site like this. Um, they come in many different styles, many different sizes and shapes. These are all being made in Europe, right? They're being made in Venice and London and Amsterdam and Bohemia. And the folks there have really no idea like what's gonna happen to these things, but they hear that there's a desire for these blue glass beads and the French voyageurs really want those, so they send them off with barrels and boxes and they end up here in the Western Great Lakes. Um, well, these ended up in Michigan, but you get the idea. Um, beads make us pretty excited as archeologists. I have to say, um, we kind of geek out about them because we can use them to tell time in this time period when radiocarbon dating doesn't really work very well because it'll tell us something like, oh, you know, 1700 AD plus or minus 50 years. Well, that's great, but a lot happened between 1650 and 1750. Imagine everything that's happened to us in the last hundred years. Um, so we need, really need a narrower range of dates. So glass beads allow us to get that narrower range of dates. So 
Archaeologists, if you haven't noticed, we like to classify things. I just did, did a whole classification of scrap metal. Yikes. <coughs> Archaeologists have also done this for trade beads. And um, two archaeologists named Kenneth and Martha Kidd put together the kid and kid typology, <laughs> which basically means like it, it's a flow chart. If you find a bead on an archaeological site, you take your flow chart and you try and match it up. So like, is it wound? What color is it? Uh, how was it made? Is it translucent? All of those little attributes can be used to sort out beads. And then uh, we can use that information to tell time. So you identify the bead by type, and then you tell time. Now, you guys all do this, right? You can take a look at shoes, or fashion, or cars, or Coca-Cola bottles, and you can tell something about when it was made. So this is a fairly familiar concept for all of you. I use, um, I use uh, media technology for my undergrads. Like, we talk about Spotify and how it's different than a phonograph. The, the premise is the same. Technology changes. Yeah, it's different, right? You can't excavate Spotify, as far as I know. Um, my friend Jim Paquette, who lives over in Marquette, calls this the, um, well, he calls it the when did Lulu lose her pants methodology, but I've changed it a little. It's when did Lulu lose her shoes. So here's Lulu. Um, did you know that anything older than 50 years is an artifact? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So think about that, folks. So back in the day, back in the 1960s and 70s, Lulu was amassing this great collection of awesome shoes, right? They're fantastic. And Lulu goes on a cross-country trip. She puts all her shoes into a suitcase, straps it to the top of a VW bus, and heads off cross-country. Well, somewhere along the way, that suitcase of Lulu's <laughs> shoes falls off the top, lands in a ditch, and let's just say in 2025, some archaeologist is doing a survey of that ditch. And they find this fantastic box of artifacts. It's Lulu's shoes, and they're older than 50 years, so... Now we've got an archaeological site. That could happen. Yeah, for real. Um, so they open the suitcase and they go, okay, well I wonder what year this suitcase fell off someone's car. And they start looking at the shoes and they start consulting their shoe charts and they go, okay, we know that these are from the 60s and these have got to be from the 70s. So they start doing um, what we call a frequency seriation. It's a technical term for basically figuring out approximately when these things um, might have been deposited in the archaeological record. So we know it can't just be from the 60s, right? We've got these older or these younger shoes that tell us it must have been sometime in the 70s. But we can maybe narrow it down a little bit more than that. Do you think it was the late 1970s or the early 1970s that Lulu lost her shoes? Early. Yeah, why? Platform. Platforms, yeah. Okay, so you know that those by the late 70s, not in style, right? No, yeah. She still had shoes from the 60s. And she still had shoes from the 60s. So presumably, like, those were still okay to wear, right? It, she wouldn't have been, like, totally out of fashion. So by 79, you wouldn't want to be caught dead in these, right? I don't know why not. Those are awesome. But you're right. So in this kind of instance, what I'm trying to get at is that, yeah, we can tell almost to the year when she might have lost the suitcase. We've done this for glass trade beads. So this is a site in Marquette, Michigan that I've been working on. And we have one very old bead, a bead dated to around 1600. And then we have a bunch of beads from what we call glass bead period two. It's so about half of the beads found come from glass bead period two. They're white and they're blue and they have these oval shapes. That tells us 1620 to 1630 or so. But we also have later beads, so we know it has to be after 1620 or so, because these long red tubular ones, just like the platforms, don't show up until a little bit later. But it's only about half the, half the assemblage. So just like the suitcase of shoes, it's about 50-50. So that tells us that we're probably dating the site to around 1625 or 1630 on the basis of the beads that we found. So we've made this bead typology, we've taken a look at the beads, and we, we've been able to say, okay, based on all the beads that we found at this archaeological site, we think it dates to around 1630. Um, and that's one way of using glass beads to tell time. There's another way. And this is the way that involves lasers, so I saved it for last, because it's kind of cool. Okay, so in my dissertation, I looked at 
874 glass beads. How do I know that? I <laughs> shot a laser at each one individually, and I took a photograph of each one, and I'll show you how I did it. Um, it's really cool because it relates to this idea of gift giving that happened in the 17th century. So when the Jesuits would show up, they didn't want to like show up without anything in their hands. They didn't want to just show up unannounced. So they would often give gifts. And the Jesuits talk about giving a thousand beads to each nation uh, in some of their texts. So they talk about the idea of like exchanging beads for furs, but also for food, because they weren't very good at getting their own food most of the time. So a thousand beads to each nation. Well, I'm going, Okay, that's great. If they gave a thousand beads to each nation, we should be able to track that, right? Let's see if we can trace that on the landscape. We can do this because the European glassmakers actually uh, use different recipes, and those recipes changed over time. Just like you might tweak your grandma's casserole recipe and maybe cut out the lard and put in, like, you know, applesauce or vegetable oil. They're doing the same thing with glass trade beet recipes. And that's pretty cool because it allows us to understand when a site might have been getting these things. So, people always ask me, well, what are the earliest beads? So, uh, I've been working on that. Um, I've identified that this type of bead, with a particular recipe that is really low in the element calcium, is probably the first kind of bead to be traded into the Western Great Lakes. Um, there are older beads that are white and oval shaped. Those were those ones from Glass Bead Period 2 that I showed you at that other site. Um, we get these uh, kind of infrequently, but they do show up um, at a few sites in Michigan. And then we get these really cool star chevron beads, um, but we often find them broken. So just like the kettle, maybe it was more effective to break them in half and like be able to give it to two people instead of one. Um, or maybe breaking them had some kind of significance, or maybe they were just fragile. In any case, um, these are some of the earliest trade beads that we find in this part of the world. And what I did to them was took a small laser and drilled four tiny holes in each one of these beads. Um, you may be able to see them. Uh, this is called laser ablation inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. <laughs> yeah, say that after you've been talking for an hour. Yeah. So anyway, lots of beads, 25 different sites. Yes, they were all blue. Um, it wasn't just that blue beads were the only thing available at this time, um, but I wanted to focus on just one color in order to control for um, things like uh, uh, interest. Like, so if you have a bunch of different beads and maybe you're only picking the blue ones or you're only picking the white ones, that could bias the sample. So I wanted to make sure I was only looking at one color to try and control for things like interest in having one or the other color. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, cool. So, uh, what happens? Well, you take the bead, you put it into the laser chamber, the laser zaps the bead, and then the little tiny microscopic part of the bead gets turned into a gas in a plasma stream, and it goes into this detector, and all the elements kind of scatter apart. Um, and then it actually counts the individual atoms, the individual pieces of these beads, and measures how many of those individual atoms are present, and then we get a number. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, that's what it looks like. So I go and hang out at the Field Museum, and I sit in this little tiny room, and there's a vacuum cleaner running because uh, you have to have all of the air outside of the laser chamber. And then the bead kind of gets zoomed through this tubing into the mass spectrometer, and I get a number on the screen after a lot of work um, and math. But it's a really cool and minimally invasive way of analyzing these beads. So um, when I would talk to descendant communities, when I would talk to different museums, they were generally fine with this. Um, because you would get your bead back in one piece. I never blew anything up, so that's good. Um, so what do we find? Well, patterns. Archaeologists, as you know, are interested in patterns, right? We looked at the copper base metal. We're also looking for patterns in the glass data. We found change over time, and we also were able to see how people were moving around on the landscape. So let's, let's look at the easy one, chronology. We know that the European glassmakers were changing their bead recipes over time. No one had looked at blue glass beads before. So I found two big groups. This is all 874 <coughs> beads. Each bead is a dot, right? So there was a composition that had a little bit more potassium and a little bit less magnesium, and a composition that had a little bit more magnesium and a little bit less potassium. Sorry, not potassium. Phosphorus equals phosphorus. In any case, um, no one caught me on that. 
All right, <clears throat> testing you. Okay, so two big groups, right? This group comes from sites that were dated to prior to 1700. This group is sites later than 1700. Here's what I mean by that. Remember that map I showed you? Each dot represents either pre or post 1700. So stick with me as we go through some of the data here. So when I have a site that was occupied 1670 to 1700, it gets a red dot. Um, sites like Fort Michelin-Mackinac, mostly after 1700, French and British occupations. So we start taking a look at this, all those pre-1700 dots um, from this map tend to fall into the higher magnesium group. And this is true no matter what style or what type of bead we looked at, from the copper-based kind of blue turquoise robin's egg blue beads um, to these cobalt blue beads, right? So again, it's kind of sticking like into two distinct groups. Most of these kind of in the wrong, wrong cluster, those are from a site that was occupied 1670 to 1730. So it actually spans that whole time period. Um, Here's another one. It's a really good example. There's only one bead that's kind of in the wrong group. Um, so when you put it all together, it separates out really well. Um, this is removing all of the kind of in-between beads, with the exception of a few here. I think we even have a transitional glass recipe that's right in the middle, like right as these European glass makers are starting to figure out how to shift their recipes. So these are the older, uh, these are the older ones down here. These are the newer ones. And when you put this into a chart, blah, it's a lot of numbers. But you start to see that the later um, beads, the post-1700 glass recipe, come from sites that are dated later. So here the sites are put in order from youngest uh, at the bottom to oldest. So pre-1700, like a label shipwreck, which was dated to just before 1700. Um, and you start to see patterns, again. Let's take a look at one particular site, Fort St. Joseph, French colonial site, southwest Michigan. I've talked about it before, mostly occupied after 1700, 1691 to 1781. So just like the shoes example and just like the beads from uh, Goose Lake Outlet, we start to see there are more beads from the later period and less numerically from the earlier period. The cool thing about this is that these beads look identical. The types are exactly the same. So the only way that you could tell that they're different is by doing this compositional analysis. So that's super cool. We can do the same thing for um, another variety, copper-colored ones. Again, they look identical. They're the same bead, right? But they have a different chemical composition. And one would get a yellow dot and one would get a red dot, so to speak, on the map. Um, so that's really cool. We've learned a lot about different glass recipes. Remember I said low calcium blue beads were the oldest ones in the Western Great Lakes? How do I know that? Well, these dots represent beads from sites that we know from the historical records were only getting beads after 1670. And the red squares are lower in calcium. It's on the y-axis. They're getting them prior to 1670. So when you put it on a map, here's what it looks like. It looks like the places that people would have been moving around um, and trading in the very earliest arrivals of Europeans. So Jean Nicolet, the 1634 French explorer who's supposed to have landed somewhere near Red Banks in this general area. The cool thing about these is that these are not big sites. These are sites with very few trade items. The Clooney site has exactly one bead. It is blue, and it fits this chemical composition. The same, yes, the same is true with the Markman site. These are, these are important and relatively rare things at this time, it seems, it seems like. Um, Rock Island, the single low calcium bead is from the very first occupation, which dates to 1640. It's supposed to be an early Potawatomi occupation of the island. So this is possibly people moving, or it's possibly beads moving without uh, Europeans, ahead of Europeans, so being passed down the line from one community to the next. So that's pretty cool. We're going to focus on one more site. This is the first site I ever looked at as an archaeologist, and I'm kind of still trying to figure it out. This site is the Hansen site. It's in Door County, Wisconsin, and it was excavated in the 1990s, um, so I wasn't there. Um, but what happened was they had a gravel quarry, 
and they were quarrying gravel out of the ground, and they accidentally disturbed uh, a mortuary site, a burial site. So they had to call the state archaeologists. Um, and the state archaeologists said, stop what you're doing. You know, we're going to come in and check out what's going on. And so they recognized that the whole uh, edge was starting to collapse. So they couldn't preserve it in place. Um, most of the, the site had already kind of collapsed down the slump. So they screened all of this dirt. They collected everything, all the artifacts, um, all of the remains. And they uh, eventually were able to excavate even up at the top through this, this setup here. Um, and we've been trying to figure out who these people are because they have not yet been repatriated to any descendant community. So this is a project that the State Historical Society is working on right now. Um, and for a long time, we didn't know what to make of this site. Hansen is very far from Ontario, um, the homeland of the Huron-Wendat people, but the artifacts look very similar to what you might find in an Eastern Great Lakes assemblage. There's wampum which is an Eastern Great Lakes kind of bead that was used at this time. There's a whole Gulf Coast marine conch shell, like a whole shell um, from down in Mississippi. There is a lot of red stone. There's all sorts of stuff that just doesn't seem to fit in Wisconsin. And so I started taking a look at the beads. Well, Hansen fits into this early category, pre-1670. That makes sense. And the beads also were different in how they were made. They had way more uh, copper and way more zinc. These are two chemical elements that you might find at a site um, or in a bead that you're trying to make like a really bright blue. We don't see this at any other site in Wisconsin. So I went to Ontario last year to go and see if I could trace this down. I started looking at Wendat sites in Ontario prior to when they would have moved into Wisconsin in 1650. And there were three sites that had beads that were really close to those from Hansen. They had the same kind of sand that you would use to make a, um, a bead. So sand is like the basic ingredient in glass. Um, glass is mostly like 99% silica. So in any case, sometimes 99%. Um, it, it varies. The recipes vary. In any case, what's really cool is that I think we've got tracing the movement of people. People started out in Ontario and would have made this trek um, through St. Ignace, past Rock Island, and maybe kind of stopped here. Um, and then they were, were buried by family members who would have like left glass beads with them. Those would have been important. And those beads might have come all the way with them from Huronia, from Wendaki, where they would have originally started out. So I'm still working to try and trace down this connection. So I want to wrap this up here and just say that we can do this because we know that glass beads varied over time. We know that these European uh, factories were changing and kind of tweaking their recipes, trying to make them in different ways. And those recipes correspond to known dates of archaeological sites. So because we have the ability to say this site was probably occupied pre-1700 or post-1700, we can make these connections for sites where we don't have as good of a date. So we can start to kind of figure that out. And then we can even start to figure out movements of people and trading connections by looking at even broader patterns. And in January, I'm heading to Quebec City to look at yet another Wendat site um, that's occupied around 1670. So trying to trace this full spectrum of Wendat communities moving around the Western Great Lakes before returning um, all the way back to Quebec. So I didn't want to stop there. I mean because you can really never have too many beads. I just wanted, wanted to kind of point out the, the coolest recent bead thing that I've seen. Um, we can connect beadworking from the 17th century all the way up to today. And at the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C., there is this piece of art um, by a, a Uinta uh, artist. And what she's done is taken an American flag, and then within it, she has the date of every... Um, every state becoming part of the United States, but also quotes from descendant communities and the names of every native nation in the United States. And they're within kind of the red and the whites. It's in the beadwork. It's amazing. It's super cool. Um, so if you ever get the chance to go to Washington, DC, and you can check out Marvin's Canoe. Yeah. Um, but I'll, did you get to see this there? No. Yeah. 
Oh, it was it was so neat. So oh, I think it's a really cool connection to the past and the future in in using beads. Um, yeah. So here's here on 1693. Pretty cool. So I'm a teacher. I always have to have a summary slide. Otherwise, kids don't know what's on the test. <laughs> there will be no test. Don't worry. Um, <coughs> bead making did not start in the 17th century. I want to emphasize that this is something that Native people did in uh, the Western Great Lakes for literally thousands of years. And I hope someday to find an archaic bead right right over at Red Cliff. We'll see. Maybe. Um, and beads represented past and present identity and community. So you show who you are through your beads, right? I got, uh, which earrings? Got these beads in India, like doing dissertation research, or doing master's thesis research there. No one would know that. If I lost this earring and you found it on the street, you don't know anything about it. But I wear them as part of like my identity. So some of what we find archeologically we're never gonna be able to learn. Um, we would need some other kind of information that would help us. But these do have meaning for people, both individually and at the community level. And then finally, all these cool methods that we have, from measuring scrap metal, to making typologies, to zapping beads with lasers, give us more information about not only the artifacts, but also the people who use them. So with that, um, thank you very much. Next step is to go to Venice and excavate a bead workshop. 
That would be awesome. Um, I'm probably not the person to do that, but someone should so that we can actually link this back up. Oh yeah, Jeff Plath is another um, fantastic resource if you're interested in beads. He's a bead collector, right. owns a bead shop, and he's in Minnesota somewhere here, right? Uh, in Wisconsin. No, his, his shop is in Taylor Falls, but okay. he lives across from St. Croix. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. There, it's a really interesting subject because people get interested in beads for so many different reasons. Maybe you do bead work yourself. Um, maybe you just like wearing beads. Maybe you collect beads. Um, maybe you're an archaeologist and you want to tell time. There's many reasons to study these things. 